Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. This is Oliver White, the guy from your email inbox, and welcome to the final part of our Reactive Revealed series, which over 4,000 people have registered for. I love it. Today, joining us is Jonas Bonaire, who has so many accomplishments to list that I usually get something mixed up. So Jonas is the co-founder and CTO of TypeSafe. He's the creator of ACA. He's the co-author of the Reactive Manifesto and a member of the Swedish Death Nacho Jazz Group. Actually, that one's probably wrong. Uh, while I introduce today's session, I'd just like to see who's joining us today. On your screen, you'll notice a poll has popped up. When we, when we first launched Reactive Reveal, the three-part series, the entire goal was to help better answer questions from not only our customers, but other enterprises out there, such as, what does Reactive really mean, and why should we even care about this at all? How does going reactive affect our dev and ops teams? And what are kind of the business drivers and market forces that we should be aware of? And so on. So in today's amply titled presentation, we go over what you should know about resiliency, errors versus failures, there is a difference, isolation and containment, delegation and replication in reactive systems. Reactive systems are designed to maintain resiliency with an infrastructural approach that welcomes failure and recovers gracefully. So today, Jonas will broadly discuss, with a bit of code here and there, what you should know about maintaining resiliency with monolithic full-stack systems compared to distributed reactive systems, a bird's-eye view of how reactive systems handle errors and prevent catastrophic failures with isolation and containment, delegation and replication, how isolation and containment of error state and behavior works to block the ripple effect of cascading failures, and how delegation of failure management and replication lets reactive systems continue running in the face of failures using different, a different error handling context, which is, for example, a different thread or thread pool in a different process or on a different network node or computing center. Today's webinar is brought to you by the happy engineers that have completed TypeSafe's on-site expert training courses. Help is just a click away for more knowledge on Apache Spark Intro Workshop for Developers, Fast Track and Advanced Scala, Fast Track and Advanced Akka with Scala or Java, and Fast Track to Play Framework with Scala or Java. Also, we just launched a new cleaner website experience and reactive platform page redesign on typesafe.com, so I invite you to check that out. If you happen to see something weird on there, you can email me at oliver at typesafe.com, and I will get on it. So, I will close the poll, and without further ado, please give me a warm, silent welcome to Jonas Bonaire. Hi, Jonas. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Or Yeah. Excellent. So, I'll just dive right into it. That was an, that was an excel, excellent intro to the topic we're going to discuss today. Thanks, Oliver. So. Yeah. Most of you probably recognize this this picture. It's from it's from the the old movie Rocky, and and you, you know I, perhaps not everyone know know this the so the story or the plot, but it's it's about this underdog. He's I think he's he's called the Italian Stallion, or he gets called that, and and he 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 gets a shot at the title, and 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 uh, if you've seen the movie, you might remember this quote. It's one of the most memorable ones, and I, I can I can read it out loud for you. But it ain't how hard you get hit; it's about how hard you you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep more moving forward. That's how winning winning. That's how winning is done. And this is this is fault tolerance, right? Uh, you get hit, you survive at least for a while, you limp along, and hopefully, eventually, uh, you might win, right? Well, Rocky didn't win in this movie, but he, he won in some, other, in, some, in some other ones. But you, you get the idea. The problem with this, even though it's like, um, so like it's just like how, he, how heroes are built, is that it's not a sustainable strategy. Instead, I think we need to focus on what we need is really resilience. Resilience is beyond fault tolerance and resilience is what I'm going to talk about today uh, in this talk and then we we'll try to understand what it is, why it's needed and also d dive into some examples how other industries and in, in certain fields are dealing with it and what we can le learn from that. So uh, what is resilience? Uh, it's uh, it's uh, sort of defined by Merriam-Webster as the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape, the capacity to recover quickly 
from difficulties. And the important thing here and how it's different from fault tolerance is that it resilience allows you to restore full functionality, not just limp along like, like Rocky did, but actually restore and fully heal from failure and continue eventually like nothing have happened. Okay. So, uh, and also it's extremely important to understand that it, it, it does not really matter how beautiful your application is, right, or how awesome it is and how useful it is or how scalable, elastic, non-blocking, highly concurrent, modular, loosely I mean, coupled or whatever it might be, it is, unless it's up. So essentially, without resilience, nothing else really matters. And I think this is, this is something that's, that's extremely important to, to, to think about. Uh, Sid, Sidney Decker said in his excellent book, Drift into Failure, that, that uh, we can model and, uh, and understand in isolation, but when released into competitive, nominally regulated societies, their connections pr proliferate, their interactions and interdependencies multiply, their complexities mushroom, and we are caught short. And uh, I, I think what is really, the essence of this quote is really that modeling the world is actually quite hard. Actually, it's it's it. It might sound easy to read to reason about it, but 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 mo mo modeling it, especially in software, is actually extremely difficult. And and <clears throat> and software systems are in incredibly complex. <clears throat> so, uh, I, I'd like to take some time in, to study resilience in complex systems. But first, what is what is what 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 what, what is complex, and how is it different from complicated? Uh, this is a complicated system. It's it's a complicated system. is like it's usually de defined by many different small parts, and but with an emphasis that they are all different. Each one has its like precise role in the machinery, and it's actually possible, even though it might be very hard, but it's actually possible to fully comprehend a complicated system. A, a, com a complex system on the other hand, is made of many similar interacting parts with simple individual rules that leads to emergent properties where their interactions instead produce a globally coherent behavior. And a, 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 a complex system is by definition impossible to, to, fu to fully understand. This is an example, this is like a, a, an animation from I mean, illustrating game of, game of Life and it's, this, I mean, it's a set of extremely simple rules that almost anyone can, under, can, can understand and, we, and when we look at them in isolation it, it doesn't look that, that hard, right? But if we scale things up, things things easily become immensely com, com, complex, and it's all it's all impossible to to look to fully predict and comprehend what's going on. So it's very important to understand that complicated is not equal to complex. Uh, Don, Donella Meadows, I don't know if you know who she is. She, she she's been re writing a lot about system thinking and 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 and, and things like that, and she writes about. Uh, points for human intervention in complex systems, what she calls le leverage points. And, and I'll, I, if I may read the quote here, countering, counterintuitive, that's Forrester's word to describe comp complex systems. Leverage points are not intuitive, or if they are, we, now she means as, us humans, intuitively use them backwards, systematically worsening whatever problem we are trying to solve. Humans usually just make it worse, right? And I think we, we as humans, we need good models to understand failure in, in complex systems, why it happens and what we can do about it. And I, I, I understand, I'm sorry, I learned this, this model that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna walk you through now with in, from, from, the, from an excellent paper and, and also uh, uh, talk by, by Rich, Richard, Richard Cook. Richard Cook, he he he's he's an MD uh, doctor that's been doing research in 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 like failure in medical systems for many many years, and he is he and he and his colleague Rasmussen defined this model in nine in ninety seven, and I think it's a very useful model for to understand why failure happens and what's really what's really driving with the 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 the, the, the mechanics and the social mechanics.
be behind it. So in this in this model we have three different boundaries. The first boundary here is the economic failure boundary. And we have to stay within this boundary else we go out of business essentially. We run, we somehow run out of money. Then we have the unacceptable workload boundary. This is where people fall asleep. I mean where people can't produce more useful work essentially when when people are are too exhausted. And and uh, I mean you know I mean everyone has been 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 like doing doing like cr cr a crunch work uh, um, for a release or something has a, at least some understanding what what that could mean. And then we have the accident boundary, and this is this is where if you cross this boundary you fail somehow for some definition of failure. This can be can be like like in in in. In medical system, it can be like nobody dies, right? In, in computer computer science and software, it can be like no no out, outages. And in business systems, or business in general, it can be no business lost. But but when you cross this 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 one, sort of, then then you have what is called a failure. And then you have what what they call an operating point. And this this operating point then moves within this boundary. And it, it it's constantly moving within this these boundaries. And and when it crosses the accident boundary again, it's we have we have what is called a, fail, a, a failure. So now we also have we don't just have these three boundaries. We have also three different pressures. Like first the pressure, so like from management, you know, towards economic efficiency. We want if we, we want to like maximize profit and be as as efficient as as possible. So management are always you know scared that we will go out of business. So we'll try to optimize for that. And then we have that naturally, as humans, like a pressure towards least effort. We don't want to do more work than we actually have to. We really have to. We want to go home to our kids, or, 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 or I mean, have the holidays free, or whatever. <clears throat> and these two then tends to like push the operating point, like towards the accident boundary. So, um, and then eventually we cross it, and then, and then we, and then we have an outage, and then everyone panics, and we start some activities, you know, to increase resilience. Uh, it can be like new policies. We we bring in new tools. And sometimes we do like a big rewrite because the, the system didn't work the way we had hoped it would, etc. So this sort of gives us sort of creates a counter gradient towards more resilience, pushing the operating point away from the ac 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 accident boundary. But after a while, then I mean, after a year, we I mean things have been going well for a while, and then and then history repeats itself. So, so the operating point service is, is is constantly like pushed towards the accident boundary, and away from it when when we when we feel the need for the, when we feel the need for that. So then then the question is then why don't failures happen all the time? Because you you would sort of expect this 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 drifting to happen all the time. This this is because we add what is called a marginal boundary. So we we have an error margin here. This is a, the, the the marginal boundary is sort of this sort of an imaginary line. That sort of you can look at it like it's, it's like a big stop sign saying you can go here but not further because then you enter sort of risky ground essentially uh, speed limits or whatever it might be. So so getting close to the marginal boundary or or actually sort of touching it means that uh, we need to improve re resilience so we step away from it. So so then the, then the question is now if we have this margin why don't we continue to fail and fail again? Right? Uh, it's it's because we 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 usually know a lot about the marginal boundary because we have defined that. Right? That feels sort of real, even though it's imaginary. Uh, but we know usually very little about the accident boundary. It's, it's it's not until we actually cross it then we know that oh here is the accident boundary, and we and we make we make a note of that and try to remember that un until the next time. So, but but as we know, we have this like this push towards economic efficiency, and this drives us to try to 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 cross this 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 marginal boundary, and we and 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 the way we we do it is that usually we try to cross this, and then we and then we take a, a quick step back, and 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 then we do it again, and then we take a quick step back, and after a while, we've been doing this so many times, so we actually I mean we're operating outside this marginal boundary, so we we're thinking okay. Why don't we just simply operate this way? We've been doing it for a year now or two years. So nothing really bad happened, okay? And 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 then we sort of move the marginal boundary closer and closer 
to the accident boundary. This is, this is called the uh, normalization of deviance. Diane Vaughan wrote about it when she, when she w was writing about the Challenger. I don't know if you know this aircraft, the rocket that, that crashed. The, 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 the decision that led to the launch of, of Challenger is sometimes also called flirting with the margin. So I, I, th I think for me, the, the, when, I, when I saw that, it was sort of a revelation. It was, that's a, sort of an understanding the psychology behind failure and why we, we act the way we do as, 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 as humans. So, so, and I, but I, so since we're always operating then at the, at the edge of failure, really, I think we, we really need to learn to fully embrace failure and to design for failure from, from the start. We need a way to manage failure. So now let's take a look at how some other sciences manages failure, starting with resilience in, so, in, in social systems. Uh, a friend of mine that's he's, he's doing research in in in, uh, in environmental research uh, center in Sweden he sent me this when I started talking about him, with him about resilience he sent me a paper that I found really really interesting that actually f found uh, sort of actually maps very well to, to, to the way I think about uh, how we do resilience in, soft, in, in, in software systems so I'll tie it back to that later. Um, so this 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 paper called "Dealing in, Sec in, Sec in Security" by Mike Bennett and Vinay Gupta, they talk about this simple critical infrastructure map and and, and, and I mean and how we can understand vital services and how they keep keep us safe, and and they they, they essentially def define there six ways to die. We you you can die from being too hot, from too cold, from hunger, or some from thirst, from illness or, or injury. That is the, sort of the pie slices in this. In this sort of in, in this illustration, and then we have three sets of essential services that protect us. We we have shelter that, that protects us from being too too hot and too cold. We have supply that helps us from from dying from hunger and thirst, and then we have safety that that, that prevents us from dying from illness and injury. And and all these different services and different variations of these services are then laid out in layers around us as, in, as individuals. So we have, we have seven layers of, of, inf of infrastructure, so layers of protection that protects us as, individu as individuals. We start with some, starting with the world. We have things like, like, like energy markets, food and fuel markets, right, that, that gives us supply of of resources we need. Then we have the country, like you said, there with the military, the regional, we have the police, city, we have hospitals, water plants, neighborhood, we have my food shops. I mean, in, in, in the home, we will have heating, like a toilet, refrigerator, tap water, and things like that, and then all the way down to the, to the individual. So we have these sort of layers that protect us from dying. And, and um, so this, like, looks similar to an onion, right? And, and this is like actually, maps very well to how I think we should design software, but I'll get back to that later. In general, there, I mean, uh, there are a lot of people define sort of seven core principles for, for building resilience in, in social systems. These, these are taken from, from Reinet Biggs. Uh, by the way, I have all the, all, the, all the reference at the end, as well as some of, sometimes at the bottom of the slides, as you can see here, if you want to read the paper yourself. So uh, I, w I won't go through all of them, but the, the top ones I think are very relevant. That I think we should we should we, we should remember and keep in mind. The first one is maintain diversity and, re and redundancy, and generally systems with many different components are generally a lot more resilient than systems with with few components. And you might you might ask why? <clears throat> it's a, it's a, it's essentially because this redundancy leads to, gives us sort of insurance policy in a way, right? <clears throat> that you. you like similar to to this, the, you know, this saying that don't put all the eggs in the same in in the same basket, where some components can actually compensate from the failure in 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 others. Then we have uh, managed connectivity. Connectivity can 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 be both good and bad. It, it it can help you to like rapidly recover from disturbances, but it also but also means that disturbances can actually spread more rapidly, which which might not be a good thing. Uh, the, the, the third one, manage slow variables and feedbacks, is it was also very important uh, to, learn, to, to, to think about in, compu in computer systems, I think. And feedback between variables can either, you know, both reinforce, I mean, give, give us positive feedback as well as dampen change, negative feedback. 
and 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 uh, there are whole theories like uh, feedback systems and control theory and stuff like that. I don't have time to go through that in this talk, but it's 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 definitely something that we as as engineers should learn more more about. So there 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 there's a lot more to say about this, but I'll I'll continue now, and instead dive into resilience in bio in biological systems. Uh, one really interesting story that I learned from from uh, from, a, from a TED talk by Nicholas Peroni, where he actually talks about complexity theory, is a story about meerkats. I, I I personally really really love meerkats. They are they are really interesting eat creatures. They are extremely social in many different ways, and and and. Uh, there's a lot to say about it, but they essentially they have very rich social behave behaviors. One of the interesting things about them is that, you know, they, it's only the dominant couple that that's allowed to have babies, and all the other ones in this in this in this meerkat colony are supposed to be servants and and babysitters essentially. Uh, and in the in this experiment, GPS so trackers were added to the meerkats, and and meerkats were or observed crossing. Uh, a road between different feeding places, and it was the dominant female that led the the meerkats to the road. But once she she hit the road, she stopped and 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 and, and sort of and gave way for for the subordinates to cross the road. And if they managed to cross it safely, then after a while, she crossed it um, uh, over to the next feeding place. And 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 you know that is the, the 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 dominant female in this group is very very important. If she dies, I mean, no one else produces babies, and the whole group is at risk. And it's like evolution that produced this behavior over thousands of years as a way to improve resilience for the whole group. In essentially, the pattern of giving like giving way to subordinates, delegating dangerous work to 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 subordinates. And we will come back to this 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 pattern as well. Um, so when reading more about social, uh, oh sorry, about bi bi biological systems, we I, I actually understood that they are they are very similar. I'm sorry, the what we can the rules that we can learn and why they are resilient are very similar to 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 social systems. Here again, they feature diversity and redundancy. They have an interconnected network structure. They do they 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 give they display like a wide di di distribution of of across many different scales, and they have a way to like self adapt and self organize very similar to social systems resilience in social systems and then Nicholas Peroni sums it up very well in his in his TED talk I encourage you to watch it it's a very entertaining one where, where, where he says that animals show extraordinary social complexity and this allows them to adapt and respond to changes in their environments in three words in the animal kingdom simplicity leads to complexity which leads to resilience and this brings me to resilience in computer systems. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we often react like this. Right? First, not at all, and then with complete panic. And uh, uh, this, um, I think this slide is probably the most important one in the whole talk, at least the, the most important wisdom that, the, that I've sort of uh, collected uh, in uh, where Richard Cook in this in this great paper, How Complex Systems Fail, said that complex systems run in degraded mode. Complex systems run as broken systems. It's very important to under, understand that, that in a non-trivial complex system, something is always failing somewhere. That's a fact. It's nothing that you can even, even try to prevent, actually. Which, which brings me to the what I think is the most fundamental lesson in this talk, the thing that I would like you really to, re to remember and, and take away if you're only, only taking away one thing, and that is that resilience is by design. Resilience is really something that you cannot bolt on afterwards, even though that's, that's way too often the way I see people deal with resilience in computer systems, something they can like slap on later when they need it. But that's completely wrong. It, Resilience need to be part of the design from day one. This photo is is from a is 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 from a on a from a home, uh, and a picturing a home in Gilchrist uh, in Texas. It was designed to to resist floodwaters, and it was one of the few, as you can see, that survived the Hurricane Ike in 2008. Really, a house that was built with resilience from ground up. So let's now take a look at some patterns and strategies how to manage failure. Because I really think that 
we need to fundamentally change the way we think about failure. Failure is, is, is inevitable. Fail, failure is actually something that is natural, not something perhaps we'll enjoy and like and, 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 and encourage, right? But it's, it's, it's natural. It's, there's nothing exceptional about failure, even though it's, 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 really, it's, it's really bad that it's sort of called exceptions in Java and, and even Scala and, and many other languages, right? There's really nothing exceptional about it. The way I would like us to look at failure is that it's, an, it's a natural state in the life cycle of the application. So just like start, stop, pause, and resume, you have failure. And if you look at failure like this, then it's just yet another state in a, in, in a well-defined state uh, machine. So then you know, it, it, since, you, since, since you're older pre pre prepared for it, you know exactly how you should get out of that state and continue functioning. So we need to design for failure and manage it. Richard Cook also said that in the same uh, paper here, how complex systems fail, that post-accident attribution to root cause is fundamentally wrong because overt failure requires multiple faults. There is no isolated cause of an accident. What he's saying is really that there, there is no root cause. And I don't think, we, we often spend way, too, spend way too much time trying to find that, find the bad guy, you know, the, the black sheep here that took the whole system down. And it takes time, and the result you'll, you should usually take, come up with is, is, mo is most often wrong, and actually very often even misleading, pointing in the wrong direction. Because as, 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 as we learned in the beginning, we, I mean, we humans, we, 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 we usually, understand complex systems in a fully counterintuitive manner. And, and uh, instead, I think we need to spend time <clears throat> developing a strategy for how we can manage failure. <clears throat> Sorry, I need to just take some water. <clears throat> so one, one core for philosophy here is to fully embrace crash-only software. This is a great, it's actually the name of a great paper by Candia and Fox called Crash Only Software, where they, they define it as stop being crash safely and start being just recover fast. It's a very simple way to look at the world, <clears throat> but very powerful. And, and it's, it's, it's like it's, it, it helps us to escape like non-deterministic bugs called by, called by inc inconsistent state. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about state later. And this is sort of a sledgehammer, but it's, I think it's a very useful one. Another great quote from this from this paper is that I just have to have to read out loud for you. That we'll come back to later, especially when we talk about protocols. Is is and I quote: "To make a system of interconnected components crash only, it must be designed so that components can tolerate the crashes and temporary unavailability of their peers." This me this means we require first strong modularity. With, with relatively impermeable component boundaries. Two, timeout-based communication and lease-based resource allocation. And three, <clears throat> self-describing requests that carry a time to leave information on whether they are idempotent. I really think this is the way we should design protocols, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to that. And you might have heard about Let It Crash, you know, the, the actors of Erlang, ACA style of failure management, and that's fully embracing crash-only software. Um, Another very interesting sort of twist on this crash on the software is another paper by the same guys. It's called Recursive Re Re Restartability, Turning the Reboot Sledgehammer into a, sca into, into a Scalpel. <clears throat> and and uh, this gives us sort of, what they talk about here is the ability to, to apply this crash on the software, but at a finer and finer granularity, to, to have a system that tolerates restarts at multiple levels. And uh, I think this is extremely important. Another great quote from this from this paper is 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 that, and I quote: "Software components should be designed such that they can deny service for any request or call. Then, if an underlying component can say no, apps must be designed to take no for an answer. Decide how to proceed: give up, wait, retry, reduce fidelity, etc." End quote. So what they're saying here that services first they must be allowed to say no, but also they, 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 they must be able to cope with being told no. They, if, if, we just, if we design systems like that, we, we get very resilient communication and very, very resilient protocols between them and a very loosely coupled architecture, I believe. 
Sidney Decker, once again, from his great book, Drifting to Failure, says said that the explosive growth of software has added greatly to systems' interactive complexity. With software, the possible states that a system can end up with become mind-boggling. <clears throat> and I, and I, I, it's actually a fact that almost all failures relate to state data in some way. I mean, inconsistent data, partial data, wrong data, lost data, duplication of data. So let's now try to classify state and what we mean when we talk about state. I, there's probably many ways of doing it, but the one way that I tend to look at it is that you have, you have three types of state. You have static data, static state. There's, there's stuff like you read from, com, from config files that, that do not change. The state that's like always available to you. You can always get it. Then we have scratch data. That's like like data, like, te like temporary data using in computations and so on. It's important while you're doing the computation, while you're using it, that you can throw it away afterwards when you have the result. And then you have dynamic data, and dynamic data can be put into different categories. It can even either have dynamic data that can be recomputed <clears throat> based on 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 a stable base, based on static data. Um, but there's also so sort of not recomputable uh, the dynamic data, and this is the critical data. This is the data that if you lose that, um, then then you lost it. There's nothing, no way that you can get it back. Like that's like that's like things like user input, for example. It's, it's hard to like, go and ask the user again once the session stopped, that that uh, or after the session crashed for for new data without annoying him. So, so this is this is the sort of the, the critical state that we should that we should pay attention to. <clears throat> so, so in this illustration, I'll try to, uh, to to illustrate like traditional state management and also error management. And the and the legend here is that you know the white the white ball here, as you can see up in the upper right, is a client. The blue one is sort of an object in the system, and and this red box is sort of a critical state, dynamic critical state that needs protection that we just cannot lose. Else we can't function. We can provide our, our meet, 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 meet our SLAs or, or actually pr provide our, our, our service. And the dotted line here is the thread boundary. Okay. So, so now <clears throat> let's let's say that we have this this system. Like all, all these objects are, inter, inter, are interconnected and providing some sort of service. And then we have a client that comes in and and and, and does a request. Okay. And then in 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 sort in, sort of tra in traditional state management, then a synchronous call is made. I mean, so, so then throughout the same thread, you have multiple of invocations of different objects. Now the question is, what happens now if 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 some if, if something fails? Then the whole stack is is blown, like components after component after component, cascading all the way up into the face of the of the client. And the problem is that first, this is the failure man management that we've grown up with. This is, this is the way we do failure management traditionally: JE, Java, C++, JavaScript, and so on. And the problem that I see with this is that it's utterly broken. Okay. Uh, um, you 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 are giving a single thread of control. If that th so thread blows up, then you're screwed. And and because, as I said, the whole stack is blown all the way up. And since exceptions and failures do not propagate between threads, unless you actually are there with the try cache block, cap capturing it, and and in yourself how somehow notify someone else, then everything is silent. Nobody, no one even knows that something went went wrong. And this is why we as developers, with this way of dealing with 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 failure, have to literally add try catch statements. Everywhere, because you know, critical state is usually almost everywhere, and and something can go wrong almost anywhere. So our business logic and our nice application becomes completely tangled with error handling all over all over the place. And I really think that we can do a lot better here. And I, I think the requirements for a sane failure model is that failures need to be four things. First, they need to be contained so they don't spread across, I mean out to, to other components, I mean cas in, sort of cascade. They need to be, be able to be reified, uh, like turned into 
an object that can actually be sent away somewhere. So they need to be reified as messages. They need to be signaled and signaled in an asynchronous fashion. If they're not signaled in an asynchronous fashion, then you have strong coupling that will lead to cascading failures again. Then you don't have the containment that's necessary. Then this also need to be observed. They need to be like reified as messages, signaled, and they need to be someone that's, that's there to listen to this failure. And, and then later managed. And the nice thing is, is if, if, if it's failure signaling, then, it's, then you're not like only tied to throwing it right into the client's face, meaning that one thing, one component there understand, but you can actually send it to anyone that might be interested in the failure of this component. And, and, yeah, and finally, as I said, management. I mean, if, 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 this, if, if the failure is, 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 is notified by someone outside in another context, then, then that healthy component, that healthy context, can 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 manage the unhealthy, the failed component. Okay, and and I'm going to use now uh, uh, the samples. I'm going to show you how this can be done in practice, or from or, for, or from Aka. Naturally, that's my primary tool of choice, and Aka. Uh, uses like have have a model for failure that is built in at its core. And, and it embraces most of the patterns that we've talked about here. So, 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 so first, if I was just want to summarize what, what an actor is, if you, if, you, if you may not know that. Actors are extremely light, lightweight, like react to resilient components. You can easily create millions of them. They're not like in any way tied to a thread, but they run on a thread whenever they, they, they so the, the scheduler executes them and it says that now it's your, it's your turn. They are resilient by design. That means that they are fully encapsulated and, con and have containment as part of the model. So failure do not leak and do not spread. Uh, they communicate through asynchronous me message passing and, and they are fully thread safe. So this is, they are like these, these safe islands of consistency uh, in, a, in sort of in a in a sea of non-determinism, as I usually explain it. You have messages flying all over the place and there's non-determinism everywhere. Like, I, your island is like your safe haven. You know that there everything is, is de deterministic and it's, it's fully thread safe and you can relax and, and do your business logic without worrying about things. So, uh, just showing some example what an actor can, can look like. First, you, you, first you create the, the message. That's, that's sort of your, your protocol, essentially. Uh, uh, these are the, these are the messages that I, as an actor, can can will will respond to. The, then I create my actor. That that's just a, cl a, a class. By the way, this is this is Scala code. Aka also has Java APIs. If if you if you like to use that, and and then you create the actor's behavior. That is, what should the actor do when it receives this 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 message? And each actor has a mailbox where the scheduler takes the actor, takes the first message out of the mailbox and put it into the actor to be executed and then this logic is run, essentially. And the question is how to create an actor. Yeah, you do that through this, this factory uh, actor of on the system and out, the, out there then comes what is called an, 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 an actor ref. So the, the instance of the actor is decoupled from the reference to the actor. And this is very important when we, when we come to distribution and things like that, and also to, to, to the failure model. You only have sort of an address to the actor, where it's actually running, if it's failing currently and can be restarted, that's none of your business really. You don't have to worry about that, because, because, because you're just using this address and you can rely on that, it's always stable. And, and then you can send a message to the actor through this bang operator. And this message is sent asynchronously. All communication with actors are always asynchronous. It's based on the message passing core. So now let's take a look at, look at what we can do then. Uh, 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 or how we can think about uh, sort of the containment part. We, I think, I think we, um, so, so, so the containment, uh, the, the, the way of, of like, the idea of containing failures is really nothing new. That's the, the, that's the way the, sh the ship industry has been dealing with failure for years, uh, where they actually so they split up the the ship into different comp compartments. So if one of the compartments got filled got filled with water, that wasn't that bad, right? Because 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 faith, that was contained and 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 didn't fill up any any of the any of the other ones. The, everyone always brings up, yeah. What about the Titanic? When I when I talk about that, and and it's actually a really good example of cascading failure, not of the bulkhead pattern, because you know in the in the Titanic they didn't have, these walls didn't go all the way up. 
So when so when this iceberg like ripped up and four or five different compartments and it started to tilt, water started to spill over to the next from one compartment to the next to the next to the next. So it's actually really a good example of synchronous, you know, uh, sort of call change uh, in, in traditional state management where, where one failure can take down the whole, the whole application. And I really think that we can do a lot better uh, uh, by, 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 by sort of learning from this. So, so, so the way I, I tend to look at it is, as, as I said, through, 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 the, through the lens of supervision. So as I said, we need we need a, a way for the, for the failures to be signaled, observed, and managed. And then there's there need to be this outside guys or this outside context that's healthy that looks at another component and 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 see how it's doing. And if it's doing well, yeah, then it's nothing to do, right? But if it's starting to 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 go bad, then this supervisor then can deal with that. And and and, uh, and this supervision gives us actually a system that 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 can self heal. And and I'll I'll try to explain this through the analogy of the, of the vending machine because I, this sort of helped me to understand uh, how to think about this sort of way of thinking about the, the, uh, the, this way of, of 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 sort of thinking about failure management, so to speak. So let's say you have this programmer now, and he's he's really eager eager for, eager for coffee, and he walks up to this coffee machine. And he inserts coins. Let's say, I mean, a, a coffee costs like two quarters, and now he inserts one quarter, uh, or one, uh, yeah, one quarter, and 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 um, and the coffee machine says, "Oh, add more coins." So, I mean, you you didn't fulfill your part of the of the, of the contract. You're not going to get your coffee. You can you, you can do that by sort of displaying a, like a label in the in the in the UI or something like that. And then the the air, so the, the the program comes in and, and adds more coins, and uh, then he gets his coffee. The program is happy. Now let's see the next day the the program comes in and he adds two coins, okay. And in he gets an out of coffee beans arrow thrown throw, 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 uh, thrown in his face. The the problem is that as a programmer now, how should I what should I do with that? Where is the coffee? I mean, where I mean, is it some storage somewhere behind, or like somewhere down the hall? How should I know? I mean, I, do I have the key to this coffee machine, and so on? That's really not the way. I mean, sort of a good UI should be designed, and how failure should be managed in this way. Instead, I think that this this out of coffee beans failure should should be sent to some sort of service guy that walks around in the floors, different hallways, and and and, and fixes the coffee machines. And he should like add more beans, or, or like fix the grinder, or whatever there might be. Add more water to, to 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 the tank, and the programmer gets his coffee. Okay, so so here is the important di di distinction in what is an error and what is a failure. Errors in the case of, of, of sort of validation errors, I think, should be thrown into the client's face because that the, 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 the client then has not lived up to his part of the part, part of the contract but <clears throat> most often we actually we throw everything into into the client face even like uh, failures like application failures like like this service might not be functioning because some other service is down the database is down or, or the service is overloaded or something like that it's completely wrong to throw that in, into the client's face. Instead, that should be sent somewhere else where someone can actually deal with it in a good way. And this is where the supervisor comes in. So if application failure should be sent <clears throat> upwards, while validation errors and other errors that the client respond, is responsible for should be sent like horse, horizontally. <clears throat> uh, and there's very important also to distinguish between what is really a failure and what is an error. Okay. And and as Sidney, as, Sidney, as Sidney Decker said, accidents come from relationships and not broken parts. And so 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 I, in, instead I think still, instead of having as, as as in the traditional state management having state like scattered across the whole application, we should define a minimal error kernel, that's usually the word, the word we use. And this error kernel holds and manages this critical then not recomputable di dynamic data, the data that you simply cannot use. And the thing is that the error kernel 
never ever performs a dangerous operation himself. But he actually always delegates. He never talk, I mean, he talks directly to external re re resources, for example. He never directly accepts user input. But he instead delegates to someone that can do that. And if that component fails, the, the error kernel will find out and can spawn up the, that service again and try again in a few in a few uh, minutes or, si or or similar. The important thing is that when a request hits the error kernel, then we can always assume correctness. We know that this request is valid, is fine, nothing can go wrong. So let let's look at an ex an, an example of that. What I call like onion layered state management. Okay, so then, then we have a system here, and 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 then we in this system we put our critical state in what we call then the error the error kernel. Okay, and then and then we, as I said, we always delegate work to sub subordinates. We have these layers of protection. Okay, that that can do signaling and observation and management of failure and also as, as escalation if needed. So so for example, if 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 a client comes in here. Here and 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 uh, does a request to this service. Let's see if my animation works here. Uh, th then, if so if 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 something goes wrong, then 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 you know that since you can see this red line here, since since the thread boundary is only the component itself, this means that that there is nowhere this failure can go. It's fully isolated within this component. So instead, what's happening is that a notification is sent up to the supervisor, and so the supervisor can then listen and observe this failure, and is healthy and fine, living in his own little little safe box here, and he can then manage that failure by restarting the component, and the client can try again, and everyone is happy. Um, and and the the interesting thing is, I don't know if you if you remember the Mirkas. This is exactly how Mirkas work. You know, they delegate the, the dominant female delegates to the sub, to the subordinates, and and uh, and and to do dangerous work. And and if everything went fine, she 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 performs her work, then cross the road. Or if something went wrong, she she sends another one, and 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 uh, hopefully that will go better, and then she and then she can cross the road. And if, if you remember this 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 simple cri critical infrastructure map, where you have like layers of protection, like layers of defense protecting us as individuals, this is exactly how onion layered failure management work. I really think it maps very well to how I think how how I think we should design uh, software. Uh, and uh, to take a look at some 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 practical ways to do that. I mean, this is of course general patterns that you can do you can use in any way. Right, uh, so you, you use almost in, in almost any language and 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 and, and so on any platform, but uh, the way we do it in 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 Arca is that every actor has a default supervisor strategy. We have what we call mandatory parental supervision. It means that every actor that this, for example, that every actor that an actor creates, they, they are what we call child actors. They are automatically managed. Uh, and and sort of watched, sort of, sort of supervised. Okay, so so you have this in this example. You have the, you have this parent actor, and here we have sort of overridden the default supervised strategy. That's actually almost almost always a really good idea because, as I said, failures are messages, and they have semantic meaning. It's very important that we define the well typed, you know, which actually we have not done here in this example. It's actually a terrible example. I'll fix that <laughs> later. But I think I think we should always have very very very, very like specific error messages. Uh, in in this case, this is or implement some sort of some sort of math service here. If it's an if it's an arithmetic exception, you can see then we then we say we're going to resume that because then it's probably user input. If it's a null pointer exception, this clearly inconsistent state. It's probably a bug. Then we restart, try and get rid of the state. If it's anything else, then we don't know what it is, and then we escalate. Okay, and the, and, and and then I mean all. Sort of children that this actor creates are then supervised according to this supervisor strategy. Uh, so, so, so we also distinguish between you know 
sort of managing the life cycle, being able to do something, restart the component, and just watching, I mean, understanding if something went wrong. I, 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 as a client, might be interested in the health of a specific service. Then I can watch that through what is called death watch. So if I'm, for example, using this, some sort of client, some, 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 some sort of service here, I can, I, can, I can decide to watch it. And 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 then I will receive a termination signal whenever it's it 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 went down. Once again, here, sort of, sort of, I can d d distinguish between between the sort of supervision for the sake of, of managing the life cycle or support sort of just watching uh, uh, an error happen and then being notified about that. Uh, but this is not sufficient, right? Because if, if you remember the, 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 the top lesson from, 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 from resilience in, in social system and biological system was that we need to maintain diversity and redundancy and we need to have an, in, an interconnected network structure. This also applies to software systems because you can never run a resilience system on a single node. If that node goes down, the hardware failure, whatever, then you lose everything anyway. So, so, so you, 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 you always need to like fully embrace rep replication, both for availability but also for 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 spread of load. And and Aga's tools here is like is 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 first doing sort of this on a single machine using Aga Aga, Aga routing. I mean, all actors have names. You can refer to them from a configuration file, where you from the outside can can define a specific actor. To for example become a router. It means that any number of instances of this will be, will be, will be spun up, as many, as many as you define, and, and all the requests that goes to this actor that the, now, that the client still thinks is just one actor will then be, be, be going to this pool of actors now running somewhere on the server. But you can, you can, you, you, but you can of course take that further because, as I said, if the if the if the if the if the, if the no goes down, I mean, you lo you lose everything anyway. And here is where you should bring in Aka cluster. And as you see, we just like a few more lines of of, of code in the in the configuration file. You can turn this this now this into a, a fully clustered router with replicas or sort of sort of with, with routes running on on different replicas. Uh, and and this is all thanks to Aka's location transparency. That that, that, that this the reference is is like to the actor is decoupled from where from where from where 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 it is running. And this means that it can run anywhere in the cluster. It can actually change location while while it's being used and while it's being running. Uh, which is which is also really really nice. And another really nice thing is that you know the failure model just works the same on the cluster as it does on a local machine. So there's nothing new to learn, nothing new to, to, to new techniques or new tools to bring in. Just configure things to run in the cluster, spin up some more nodes and 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 uh, everything will just work as they did on on your single machine when you when you were testing it. Uh, but, but as we know like running multiple nodes in a distributed system with a network between means that that, that things can go wrong, right? I mean you know, one of one one of the top fallacies in Peter Deutsch's list of, of fallacies of distributed system is that the network is 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 reliable, right? We all know that this is not true, because we can have partial failures. We can have messages can be like you know delayed, lost, reordered, duplicated, and failure detection is really just a guessing game. We can never know if a node is really down, permanently down, or if it will if it's just doing garbage collection, it's being under heavy load, it's being upgraded or whatever. And we'll come back just in a second. So we always need need to take guesses here. And I really have to say that I think that strong consistency is really the wrong default. This is this is what what we've been taught to to, to like sort of this, this this hammer that we always should should should, should apply. You know, X A transactions or Paxos or to face commits and stuff like that. And they are very powerful tools, but I think we should never ever start start with that. Eventual consistency should be the default, and then bring in. Get, I mean, sort of levels of stronger consistency when you need them because they are really expensive. They're extremely hard to make available. They're just too brittle, and, and you often, more, very often, don't need them. Actually, it's just that you need to change the way you think about the world, because we really need to think. I think we need to embrace this thinking that we need decoupling in both time. You know, decoupling in time means that the sender and receiver are decoupled in time. You have this asynchronous boundary, and this gives us concurrency. This is and 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 this loose coupling and this 
has a, have a way to have like a failure boundary where the failure can actually be, be contained. Uh, but we also need to be decoupled in space. This gives us this distribution, you know, so we can actually di di distribute our, 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 our running computation onto multiple nodes, or sorry, multiple cores, or multiple nodes, or multiple data centers. And here I think reactive patterns, you know, like you know, from a reactive manifesto and so on, can lead the way to really to more resilient applications. And, and I think we, we need to base the sort of this communication on resilient protocols. I already briefly touched on this, but I think we really have to depend on asynchronous communication and eventual consistency for loosely coupled systems. And these protocols, they, if, if you design them like that, they are usually tolerant to, to all these things like message loss, message reordering, message duplication. And there is this funky acronym that's sort of been 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 starting to be to be be used in, in popular called ACID 2.0. You know ACID like atomic consistent isolated durable. ACID 2.0 means embracing sort of protocols and ways of communication that are A stands for associative, means that they are sort of batch insensitive. We can, you can batch things up. They are commutative, means means that they are ordering insensitive. Operations can commute. Which is very important if you want to scale things out and don't have to like order or message and do reordering yeah, on the other side. Messages I stands for item potent, which means that uh, that that they are duplication insensitive. I mean, it really doesn't matter if 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 a message is duplicated, and D stands for distributed. I guess probably just to get a sort of funky acronym. And there's been a lot of interesting things read it or written about this. I won't go into detail, but Pat Tellen have done it in in a couple of great papers. And so on. And this is really how the how the how the world works. I mean, the ATMs, you know, they allow withdrawal, uh, even even the, when there's a network drop, and then they compensate later. And or, for example, and every, I mean, everyone that's sort of been flying a lot, you know, that they, the the airlines usually overbook the flights, and then they try to bribe them, them themselves out of this problem by 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 uh, by sort of handing out you know vouchers and stuff like that. Uh, so, so another great tool then to, to embrace this fact that everything needs to be eventually consistent and we can't have strongly consistent data all the time is ACA's distributed data module. This is, this is a module that we added in ACA 2.4 and it's essentially two things, like it's, it's, it's a library for CRDTs, that's like, like uh, conflict-free replicated data types and there is also a, a sort of an engine for a tool for distributed data replication. And if, if you haven't used CRDTs, they are extremely power, powerful. They are, I mean, they essentially give you all the properties that all these, you know, this, the, the, you know, this NoSQL database give you, gave you like Dy the Dynamo style of, of SQL, like React and, 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 and Cassandra and so on. But instead of just being key value stores, like most of them were, you get rich data structures with the same properties. So you can have sets, sets, maps, or even graphs and, and counters and things. And they do compose, so it gives you like a great tool to work with with rich data structure like we are used to but still have the nice properties that they will always converge they will always be consistent eventually so uh, and this is sort of a little example of that I don't have time to go through that but this is actually taken from a great blog that that Patrick wrote just the other day so I encourage you to take a look at that instead uh, so uh, I don't. I'm sort of running a little bit out of time. Sorry for that. Uh, I have a little bit more slides, but I think I'm just going to just going to just jump to 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 the conclusion here. Uh, let's see. I, first, I just want to say a few words on testing because I think that's extremely important. Uh, I think. I think. I mean, first, like oh, the way I like to look at testing is it's like it's like. It's like learning from Arnold, right? Well, what can what can we learn from Arnold in this in this video? I think we should just we should just learn and 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 to just blow things up essentially, and, and and see and essentially just see what happens. Okay, I mean we we should like use tools to try to shoot down the application and then understand when it breaks. We do that where it breaks and how it breaks. We should uh, we should just pull the plug essentially. I um, mean, you could just cut them and just pull the plug or, or pull the Ethernet cables out here and there and, and, and see what happens and then take notes. And, and, and you will you often be very surprised that what you thought was going to happen actually didn't happen. A failure in one machine can cause something happen somewhere, uh, somewhere else, like in the most unexpected 
places. Because, uh, because as I said, like we, we, when we work with, with complex systems, they are completely counterintuitive and, and, and it's really impossible to fully comprehend that without really really, really, really testing it. And, and there are a lot of great tools now. I mean, uh, you've probably heard of Netflix, Chaos Monkey, and you know, the Chaos Gorilla, and this part, all part of this Simian army. And Akka also has, has, has a bunch of great tools for doing for doing these kind of type of things, like the multi JVM and multi node test kit, and and you have Gatling, which is also an application, uh, sort of a testing tool written in Akka for to help you shoot down your application and see see and see what happens. And yet again, I think we need to design for failures and 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 and, uh, and test failure as we test any other code, right? And 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 some companies even actually do test in production, like Netflix, because nothing beats production, right? I mean, you you can do all kind of testing in. In, in your like safe environment, but if things will still like fail like completely uh, in completely amazing ways in production. So if I will, if I'll try to summarize up what I just walked you through is I want you to remember that complex system always run in degraded mode. Complex system always run as broken systems. There's nothing that we can do about that, and w Instead of, of like, like sort of running away from that and try to pr prevent failure from happening, we should embrace it and we should embrace it at its core. We should we should build systems that are resilient by design. Uh, thank you. One one minute over over time. I just want to say as well at the end that there's a bunch of references. Uh, to all the articles that I've walked you through here. Uh, we'll post these slides later afterwards if you want to dive in some more detail about the things I've just talked about. So, Thank you. I don't know if there's time for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Jonas. This was a thrilling presentation, I have to say. Uh, there are a couple questions. People are free to uh, stay online for another three or four minutes, uh, but if you need to go, uh, that's totally understandable. We'll uh, record this and send it out to you later. I'm going to ask you one more quick poll. If you had your secret wish, which of the following training courses would you be most interested in? So, Jonas, let me grab a couple questions. The, actually, one of them was, uh, was specifically about Chaos Monkey and uh, kind of the, you know, sh error injection library uh, stuff. Uh, so, uh, one question was, are, does TypeSafe actually plan to ship anything like this? Uh, uh, or rather, yeah. you mentioned a couple things in in Akka just now. Yeah, I did. Yeah, there are, there are, there are. I mean, we 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 can of course improve on that, but there there are there are tools that we use ourselves in the Akka test kit in the in the multi node test kit. We have sort of a test conductor that 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 conducts the test that that can do some some basic uh, sort of fail, like failure injection and like mess with the with the with the with the network and things and things like that. Uh, All right. Uh, there was another question. Is there a relationship in the approach uh, for designing resilient systems as uh, compared to evolvable systems? Now, you can interpret that how you like, I think. Uh, what was what, what the difference is, or I, what what or was the is, question? What, is there a relationship in the approach between resilient and evolvable systems? Uh, yeah, I, I think so, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I mean, truly resilient systems learn from failure and can adapt. And, and you know, the, 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 there's, there's been a lot of talk. I, haven't, I didn't cover that because I didn't have time today, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of people talk about anti-fragile systems. That, 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 that is like, you know, anti-fragile is, is, is a term that means going beyond resilience even. We're, 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 we're where resilience actually, where, where, sorry, where failure actually makes you stronger. It doesn't, uh, where, where resilience just makes you, I mean, heal to, to and, 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 and go back to full functionality. I mean, uh, anti-fragile systems make you stronger and, and allows you to learn from, from failure. And, and, and in, in my experience, a lot of the similar ideas sort of uh, come, into, come into play here, that you need, you, you need isolation, you need threat, you need like error signaling, you, you, need, you need to be able to manage failure from, from a healthy context outside and so on. But what needs to be added here is feedback loops. And, 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 uh, and essentially, I mean, control system theory. And, and, and uh, I think we're not even close to, 
there as as an industry yet. I think we're we're just very we're extremely young industry, and I mean you know you 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 see all of this in biological systems and social systems already happening that they are adaptive and they are and that's why they are so resilient. And I really hope that we as an industry will learn even more from that and able to write systems that can, that can adapt and learn uh, automatically. But now you usually need some human intervention. So. so. <laughs> Well, uh, I think a lot of people are scared about the day when no human intervention is is uh, required anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Skynet. <laughs> well, uh, thank you again, Jonas. It was an excellent presentation. Everybody uh, who joined us, thanks for joining. You will be uh, emailed the video recording of this uh, webinar as well as the slide deck uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours. So check out that in your email. And uh, if you have any questions, do feel free to email me directly at oliver at typesafe.com, and I'll be sure to get you to the right person. Uh, I guess that's it for now. So thanks again, and talk to you all soon. Yeah, bye bye. Thanks, everyone.